I, I'm asking tonight this question, do you truly love me? But I'm asking it of you as much as I'm asking it of myself. I hope, you, I hope that you realise that. Of course, Jesus knew that Peter truly loved him before he questioned him. Of course he did. Who was it when Jesus was being arrested who got the sword out and chopped off Malchus's ear in an attempt to try and preserve and rescue his beloved Lord, Simon Peter? We don't read of one of the others doing it. And bless his heart, although Peter let him down, he did follow him with John to the high priest's um, father's courtyard and went in and settled down on that cold night by the fire. He wanted with all his heart to fulfil his love for his Lord, but he let him down. I think that's also true of us. The Lord's not going to hold it against us. And then, of course, when the crucifixion had taken place, who was it when Mary brought the news, was up on his hind legs before anybody else, and with John raced to that tomb? Well, John was a little fitter, I think, and he got there first, but who went in to the tomb first? Peter. To see what had happened to his Jesus. Oh dear. And then on that morning by the shore of Tiberias it was John who said do you know that's the Lord. But it was Peter who put on his garment and jumped into the sea and swam and then waded those few hundred yards to, to the shore to be with Jesus. Of course Simon Peter loved Jesus. It, it, it's something that was perfectly obvious. Now, I don't know even tonight how much I love Jesus. Do you know how much you love Jesus? I, I don't know. It's all very well coming to a little place like this, sitting amongst friends and, 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 and sharing the gospel. But what if someone came in with a gun tonight and pointed it at us and said, anyone who doesn't denounce Christ, dies this instant. What would be our answer then? And if things drag out for a long time, in lifelong misery, like for those poor Christians in a North Korean prison, at the end of five years, 10 years, 15 years, would we still be able to say, Lord Jesus, I truly love you? Praise God that so many of them can, as we hear. I know that's what he wants of me, even if I don't feel that I've reached it. Before anything else, he wants our love. Yeah, that, that's so. 1 Corinthians 13. There abide these three, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Am I giving him my love tonight? When I read scripture, of the New Testament anyway, two incidents come to my mind regarding love, which I think of again and again and again. And the first one of these is um, Mary at the meal of Bethany, when they hold 
a meal in the honour of Jesus through the raising of Lazarus. And Mary comes in with this little casket of this very, very expensive perfume. And as Jesus is reclining at the table, she pours from it over his head, over his head, until not just that room where they were, but the whole house was filled with the perfume and the scent. How do you, how do you put a measure on love like that? Huh, Judas did immediately, of course. Huh! It should be sold and given to the poor. No, no, no. Sometimes, brothers, it's just too, we can afford to be extravagant. If it's the Lord that we want to honour, if it's the Lord we want to love, why shouldn't we be extravagant? Why shouldn't we sometimes do things that other people would say, well, that was a waste of money? Why shouldn't we do things in going sort of the extra mile and the extra mile where people say, oh, I shouldn't bother with him? You can't measure love with a slide rule. It's not like that. Obviously, there are different stages of love. There is a graduation of love. As Jesus said, there's no greater love than this that a man can give his life for a friend. As Jesus did, he gave his life for his enemies. But you and I, tonight, in this room, have we got that outward longing to show the expression of our love for Jesus? that Mary had that night in that room. All Judas could think of was, what a waste. What did Jesus say? You know, she's done a beautiful thing. And the second illustration I see from the Gospel is Jesus was sitting in the temple with some of his disciples and that widow woman came in, obviously in pretty poor garb, and placed those two little tin coins into the treasury, whilst all the Jews came past full of their wealth and dropped great lumps of gold in or silver in. And what did Jesus say? This woman has put in more than all the others, for they have given out of their abundance, but she has given all she has, even her livelihood. We can't truly evaluate other people's love or even our own love for God. We, 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 but he can. He who sees everything, who's made of atom by atom, he can evaluate it, he knows, he knows. And what may be trivial in the eyes of some people may be beautiful in the eyes of God. Oh, praise God for this. Let's leave the evaluation up to him. But now let's come to the question, to the actual text. Peter takes Simon. And the first question he asks him is this. Do you truly love me? That's truly love me. Yes, the New Testament world knew of actually about six different words for love. Um, only three of them are actually in the New Testament. Eros, like the statue in Piccadilly Circus, isn't actually in the Bible. That's romantic love, sexual love. Then you get storge, as in Romans 12, 10, which is um, a love between members of a family. Um, it's only used in the New Testament in conjunction with philia when it's talking about Christian fellowship. And then there's philia, brotherly love, as in John's Gospel, chapter 5. And then there is agape, which is God's divine love, 
as in John 13 and all the way through the New Testament. And Jesus said to the son of Jonas, um, do you love me? With this one. Do you agape me more than all the others? Now you know this story as well as I do. He questioned him three times. Because just before he went to the cross, remember, Simon had boasted that even if all the others deserted Jesus, he wouldn't. He would die for him. Well, so Jesus is taking him up on that. Um, would you really, would you really, Simon? You thought so then, but is it really true? Well, Simon just answered, Lord, you know, you know I love you. And when he answered, of course, he used this word, philia, instead of agape. He must have felt horrible. He, the leader of the disciples, being asked this question with a group of the disciples round the fire. He, how awful to be questioned like that at that point. Terrible. But he had compared himself with the other disciples. And now Jesus was questioning him with the other disciples present. And that's not nice. Well, not nice for those who receive it. But Jesus had to. Had there been a touch of pride? A touch of superiority in what Simon had said on that night? I don't know. But there's certainly this truth that we should go around comparing ourselves with other Christians. That's a terrible thing to do. We shouldn't think, well, well he hasn't got any love, look at what he's done. He doesn't love Christ, look at how he's broken that particular rule, or that commandment, or that doctrine. That, that, that's terrible. Poor Peter, Lord, you know I love you. So Jesus questions him the second time. All right, Peter, Simon, is it, is it such that you do actually truly love me? Bottom word, Jesus used. And Simon answered, you know, you know it's true. You know that I love you. Tell me something, do we love him and would we love him if nobody else did? Do we love him regardless of the cost of loving him? Do we love him without self-interest, that is, wanting to try and get something out of doing something for God? And do we love him enough to die for him? But only we ourselves find difficulty in answering that question. All Peter could say was, Lord, you know I love you. So quick, his question just once more. And this time, of course, Jesus used the philia word, the brotherly love word. And this must have hurt. But then Simon had used it himself. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. You know I love you. But Jesus did two things. One, after each question he had said to him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. We'll just come to that in a short moment. The second thing he did was to show how Peter was going to die for him. As I said, he did know that Peter had got love for him. But he pointed that out to him quite, quite clearly then in um, verse 18 um, and uh, 19. He 
Yes, Peter did have love. Why is it so important? With all the gifts that God's given us, why is it love that's preeminent? And the answer to that is because God is love. It's his nature. That's the reason. The Apostle John said, whoever claims to live in him, that's to live in God, must walk as Jesus did. And Jesus said that he loved the Father and the Father loved him. He said he always did those things that pleased the Father. So, if it's the nature of God himself, he wants to see that nature in us. For we are his children. You, you, know, you know that passage in 1 John, don't you? Was it 1, 1 John 1, 1 John 3, 1? How great is the love that the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. God wants to see the family likeness in us. We're his children. Unless we're showing his nature in our nature, then we're being awkward and disobedient and um, undisciplined and, for his point of view, very saddened children. There's a song I love to sing. I often say about a song that's not in our hymn books. It's called We Shall See Jesus. What a beautiful song this is. Absolutely lovely. We shall see Jesus. But one verse says, As angels hovered, heaven was silent, watching, not doing anything, watching as Jesus was crucified. No one showed mercy to the one who had healed them. And yet Jesus loved them as he suffered and died. If Jesus could go that far for us to bring us into his kingdom, to make us the Father's children, then surely we should strive to truly love him. In that verse in 1 John 3, you know, when it says, what manner of, in the Greek, it's potapen, it's from what country, from what place. There is no other place on earth, no country where this, love of God can be found. Nothing comes up to it except for Jesus himself. Oh, praise God for that. So if that's something that God wants us to have, what's it like and how do we know if we've got it? <laughs> that's an important question. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul said this, our hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So if you and I are God's children, then go to bed tonight content with this. We do have God's love within us. 
we're not without that love of God within us, which we can then, as Jude said, keep yourselves in the love of God. You can't keep what you don't have. But Jude said, keep yourselves in the love of God as you wait for his mercy and our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. There's no, no better summary of uh, love, of course, in the whole Bible than there is in 1 Corinthians 13. Just look at this. If I've got the tongues of men and angels, don't have love, I'm a clagging symbol. If I've got prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, you know, I've got my doctrine all right and everything else that goes with it, and I can explain it to others, and I've got so much faith that I can move a mountain, if I have not love, how much am I? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I became a, a Christian pastor and in, in, in what, 1963, autumn of 1963, and here we are in 2022. But if I did have all that and don't have love, then I've had absolutely nothing. I pray that's not true, <laughs> but it's worth knowing. Look, love is patient. It doesn't just give back in kind, like so many in the world do. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. It isn't arrogant, it's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It isn't irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. All these things will pass away. But. His love won't. Do we have that kind of love? Isaiah 26, 8. My soul yearns for you. My spirit longs for you. Psalm 42, 2. As the deer pants after streams of water, so my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Then he said, Thomas Watson said, if we're settled and have peace with our Lord, that's a sign that we've got this love. That if we're wary of anything that would try and separate us from that love, it means that we've got it. If we've got a willingness to suffer, he said, for the Lord Jesus Christ, then it means that we've got this love. I'd like to add one that's particularly pertinent to my own life that he didn't mention at all. And that's found um, in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, if you haven't, if any of you here tonight haven't had fear at some time in your life, you're an amazing individual as far as I'm concerned. Because fear... Um, is one of those things that pops its head up all the time in mine, uh, most unexpected times as well. But there's no fear in this love. Then, the lastly, just before I finish, if we've got this love, in what way is it going to affect our lives? When Jesus and the disciples had finished the breakfast, Jesus got up and started walking along the shore Peter got up and followed him. <coughs> Perhaps it was that Jesus then said to him, Peter, follow me. <laughs> Peter thought, I haven't had enough of you tonight, <laughs> or this morning. But Peter got up and followed him. And as they were walking along, um, he saw John coming up behind. But what, 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 what's him? What about him? Has he got to follow you as well? <laughs> I have. And Jesus said to him, What's that to you? What is that to you? You 
follow me. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives with a small group of his disciples, after they'd come out of the temple and made their way across the valley, he began to answer the disciples' questions about his second coming. Did you notice how in this passage, twice, Jesus refers to, until I come, until I return? And what Jesus shows in Matthew 24, in that passage, is that it was going to be a long time before he came back. Oh yeah. All nations on earth would he hear the gospel. None had heard the gospel, or very few, up to that moment when they spoke. There would be wars and rumours of wars, famines and earthquakes. They don't all happen at once. Believers would be hated by all nations. There would be many false prophets and deceivers, Jesus said. And they don't all happen at once. But then in verse 10, he says this. And many will fall away from the faith. And then even worse still, in verse 12. And the love of most will grow cold. How awful. Follow me, said Jesus. Follow me. And even if Jesus' coming is not yet, if we've still got to wait many years before Jesus comes, we've still got to follow him until the Lord takes us to be with him. And what about the way we live? What about our service? As Jesus has said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that great preacher of London, who said that the very foremost characteristic of a person who loves others for Jesus' sake is to love them. If we can't do that, we're not yet made perfect in love and our service for Christ will not be as good as it could be if we did love him. And then lastly, what about those 153 fish? <laughs> I haven't forgotten them. As far as we know, this was the last time that Simon Peter had went fishing for fish. From then on, he went fishing for men, as Jesus had originally told him when he first called him. All night, Jesus had kept the fish away. In the morning, he showed them where they were, or put them where they would, the net would catch them. And they hauled it in. I think, in a way, that's a picture of what Jesus was going to do through Simon Peter and through the apostles in years to come. As the gospel spread, there would be a catch, and there would be a big one. Why 153? Well, one American preacher I heard on television one day said, because with God, each fish is special. When we pray for people, we pray for people who are special to our Lord. When we try and love people, even obnoxious people, even people we don't get on with in any way, we've got to love them for Jesus' sake, because in his eyes, they're special. They're one of the 153. And may God truly bless us. May he give us God's love. May God give me this love. Pray for me, please, that God will give me this love. I'll pray for you as I do, that God will give you this love. But above all, let's remember tonight that we've got to serve him in love until that day when either he takes us to be with himself or until that day when he comes back again. Praise the Lord.